A local security company was responding to the home for a burglary alarm. Hi everyone, this is Sean. Welcome back to my channel. Please press the like button, subscribe, share, comment. I appreciate all the dialogue and I appreciate all the comments. Most of all, I appreciate all of you. We are currently at 7,303 subscribers. I feel blessed. Thank you everyone for your support. Thank you for sharing these videos as well. Today's video is going to involve a tactical debrief video that revolves around the young security officer that was involved in a accidental shooting incident in the Encino, California area. The armed security guard fired one shot into the home. During his response to a 459 audible. A 459 audible stands for, well, 459 in California is a California penal code for burglary. The A is basically, it's an audible alarm. Every agency, every security company has radio codes much different, but generally that's what it is. If you own a security company or you manage a security company, maybe you are in a leadership role, please, please play this video during your briefing time, or at least forward this video to your staff. Preferably, you watch this video during briefing, and then you have your own debrief on how you would handle this situation as well. So let's get the facts straight. And obviously, the facts are not privy to us. There's a lot of assumptions that we have to make so let's let's try as best as possible. Unfortunately, we have to rely on the news article. Uh, I did have some sources from the security community that reached out to me with their input, their valuable input, um, but I don't have a direct source with that company. Bummer. <laughs> so what we have is we have the 459 Audible going off in Encino, California. I would imagine that somewhere in the West Los Angeles area your uppity up area, an area where people have a lot of money. Um, security officer gets there and encounters an 88 year old resident. His gun goes off and she is struck unaware. This 88 year old woman has underwent surgery and it looks like she might make it. She might, hopefully so. Please pray for this lady guys and gals. If you don't care for the lady and you care more so for the security officer, you feel empathy like I do. I feel so much empathy in this situation, just feeling what he's probably going through. Uh, it's the best for everybody also that this lady survives. Um, eventually, the security officer, it looks like he may have talked to law enforcement based on the streamer footage, but I'm not totally sure. Um, this person's not wearing any rank insignia, which means maybe he's not the supervisor. Maybe he's actually the person involved. But once again, I don't know. All I see is that officer there um, by himself talking to an LAPD officer. I don't see any other ASC officers. So we did. We do learn that he was he was booked into jail. <clears throat> um, if you're forced, if you're forcefully took taken to a police station. That's not a detention anymore. It's an arrest. So he was arrested for something. I don't know what. It was possibly a negligent discharge of a firearm. That's what my thoughts are. And the LEPD believes that this incident was an, it was an accident. Okay. Um, start off with, I personally, I mean, I don't have all the facts, but I don't believe that he, this security officer should be booked. If we are booking people into jail or putting them into jail because we're trying to punish them, um, I think that's just wrong. Just just to punish them or, or teach them a lesson. That's just purely wrong. Um, the way I would have liked that handled is obviously this officer, security officer, gets his fingerprints taken, photographs, um, get the driver's license information, and is able to confirm that this person is lives where he says that he lives. I mean, I want that confirmation. And what I would do is I would type out the report or get it typed out and sent to the district attorney's office for consideration of prosecution. But that's it. I, I wouldn't go around booking this security officer. Let the, let the courts decide. Okay. Um, now let's talk about alarm responses. 
some of you are saying, well, why was he even there? He's supposed to observe and report. No, 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 you, you don't get it. <laughs> uh, so I grew up in the SGV, San Gabriel Valley. I have worked in Los Angeles. Now, right now I live in Imperial County for the last almost what, 20 years, um, but I've worked in, an, in LA and in LA for alarm responses, like let's just say your alarm goes off. If, if it's a residential burglary alarm, many times the police will not respond. Or if they respond, it is delayed. And residents in that area or those areas get fed up and they would rather contract out with a private security company to respond to those alarms. Also, on the second, third alarm, maybe sometimes the first alarm, the resident gets a huge fine. So sometimes it's for a false alarm. So sometimes it's actually worth hiring a security company. Now, um, what, what what unfolded? I mean, what would cause somebody to discharge their firearm? I'm thinking uh, most likely that the security officer did not expect anyone to be home. Uh, maybe there was an opening in the door and maybe he was thinking, hey, this is a four or five nine in progress. This is a burglary in progress. Let me investigate a little bit further. Let me clear the corner a little bit, not enter the threshold, but clear a little bit. I'm going to cut the pie here, cut the pie here slowly see what is going on nothing inside all of a sudden this lady who's 88 years old emerges out of out of nowhere and his finger enters a trigger guard he gets startled and you have a shot going off um i have told i've been told by my attorneys before um attorneys that i've worked with in the past that when that first when there's only one shot um that goes off in a police officer involved shooting that shot is normally uh, viewed as accidental because the question is, why didn't you fire a second or third if it was intentional? But this is not always the case all the time. I'm just generalizing and it makes sense. Hey, I get startled, boom. Um, guys, I have a technique and please, if you are a security officer, especially an owner or a manager and you have no intentions of showing my video to anybody, please just see what I'm gonna do in a minute here. Um, so let me just wait until all the cars pass. Okay, so what you want to do is this is your weapon. Instead of putting your finger right here, um, I want you guys to put it up up here, about right here, midpoint to slide, maybe even higher, just like this. But I would I would discourage you from doing this. The reason for that is the start response. Oh crap, somebody just popped up. I mean, it's very easy to get to here. Okay, um, can you get, can you go from here to here if you need to? Look, I'm here. Okay, look it. I'm here. I know it's faster, but look, I'm here. Or I'm here. It's not it's not too much faster. So I recommend when you clear areas of the unknown that you do that. And guys, when I talk about training, I'm not talking about you guys or some of you watching these tactical videos, for example, GRBS, an awesome, awesome training organization. You have tier one operators, you have a former Navy SEAL, DJ Shipley, showing you how to clear corners. Although these guys are extremely qualified in what they do, I don't think they're good videos in which you should replicate what they're doing. And one of the videos, you see DJ Shipley clearing a corner with his finger on the trigger. He's taking a step, looking, taking another step, looking with the finger on the trigger. That is something that's perfectly acceptable within a higher tier of training. And if you're asking yourself or you're telling me, wait a minute, I could be that 1%, I'll just keep training out there. No, you're not the 1%. No, you can't just keep training out there. That's not your profession. You're not a Navy SEAL. You're not Delta Force, which is CAG now. You're not an Army Ranger. And it's okay that you're not. I think Damien from the Security Guard channel mentioned that DJ Shipley said in a video as a, as a caveat that he does what he does because he trains on a regular basis he has been in real world situations where there is a terrorist line on the other side of a corner. And in those situations, that's acceptable. 
for me, if I know that there's somebody with a gun on the other side of a corner and I need to pass that corner to enter a classroom or something like that, um, that's maybe downstairs, I might consider putting my finger on that trigger as I clear every section of that corner. But in most circumstances, absolutely no. As for clearing a building or, or actually entering a house, if you are armed security, your gun should be out. It should be out and it should be presented. It should be out and presented before you identify any threat that's in the house or the building. What's going to end up happening is somebody is going to have the drop on you if you don't. It's going to take you time. Now, this should only, this technique I'm telling you about um, should only be for trained personnel like police officers. In rare circumstances, private security, and I'm talking about the rarest circumstances, guys, where somebody is about to lose their life. And obviously, our guys in the military who are clearing these dangerous areas. But leave clearing buildings to people who are, are more trained. And I'm not saying this in a derogatory manner towards anybody. Um, I'm adding to some information that that Damien from the Security Guard channel made. He did like an hour or something live stream. I didn't get a chance to see all of it. Um, but I, I do slightly agree on different points. But if I was part of the live stream, um, I would say that your gun should be out. It should be retracted when you're entering a dark area inside of a building. Um, but I would also add that that should be reserved for police officers and people who are trained to do so. Um, quite honestly, if, if I have to enter a building during a burglary alarm because there's signs of intrusion, I would step back and say absolutely not. And I would set perimeter and I would contact the police. I would not go in there and start playing hero, start playing tactical ninja and clear this building. And remember, these buildings, a residence, most of the time requires like three or four people, guys. Three or four people, not just yourself. That's crazy. That's how you're going to get hurt. Now, I guess the next question is, should we be clearing these alarms? Once again, I said this many times, these are for companies that are hands-on. You can't just say, oh, we're not going to, you know, it's, it's, it's foolish to even respond and go out to these alarms. You're not going to have a contract. So go elsewhere where you're not going to have to go out and check for these alarms. But here in this video, we're assuming that that's something that you do. When you go to these alarms, I, I'll tell you this from a perspective of a law enforcement officer and somebody who has worked private security for several years responding to alarms. All in all, I have responded to over, well over 1,500, 1,500 burglary alarms. Um, some of those were actually your 211. 211 is the penal code in California for robbery. Um, I, we've, I think maybe like one or two occasions in my whole life where they actually real, but all in all, a real burglary alarm is super rare. I'm talking about less than 1% of the time, maybe even less than half percent, maybe less than a quarter of a percentage of the time. They're usually false. Okay. Having said that, there's always that percentage that they are, they're legitimate alarms. Um, when I show up to the residence or the property, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, my gun is not out, it is holstered. And I'm basically getting ready of, getting ready of any threat. So I'll have my flashlight out, and this is the dark, okay? Um, but I'll just make my initial broad approach. I will not be cutting any corners, clearing any corners, just from as far away possible, but my hand will be right there on my gun, ready to go. Um, from that position, I can get a shot. I mean, you're, you are talking about about 15 yards. Um, within two seconds, I could get I, I could get a combat effective zone hit um, within the time frame. That's I, I need to work better on that time, maybe a second half, but 
two seconds is somewhere. I mean, I want to say it's 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 your standard time. Um, now let's talk about backyards. Okay, as a law enforcement officer, I refuse to enter the backyards unless I have some more information that for sure there's no resident home. Um, not too long ago, a buddy of mine had the alarm going off and I happened to have his phone number and I called him and said, hey, is there anybody supposed to be home? And he said, absolutely nobody. Because of that, I did clear the backyard. But otherwise, I normally don't clear the backyard because what's going to end up happening is there's going to be a pit bull, a Rottweiler, a German Shepherd that's going to rush you. And that looks horrible if you have to use lethal force on, on a situation like that. Now, could you use taser? Absolutely, depending on the circumstances. But on a charging dog that's about to rip open my throat, I'm not too sure I want to use that taser. But Ton, I don't know. Again, with a charging dog, I don't, I don't know about that, guys. Um, so if I need to enter the backyard, my gun will be drawn. And I will, look, I will, use, I will utilize all of the CQB techniques that I know. Um, I guess there's like a small um, argument of keeping the gun holstered when you're checking backyards. I don't know about corner, uh, cornering. Absolutely not. You are asking, you're asking to get shot. If you are clearing corners, you're clearing the areas of the unknown, uh, bushes, um, small walls. If you're clearing that with your gun in your holster, it's extremely dangerous for you. Um, so I would suggest that you not do that. And that's coming with somebody who has tons of experience in both law enforcement and security. If, if, if you strongly believe that your guns should be holstered when you're clearing some of these areas of the unknown or vulnerable areas, don't enter these areas at all. Stand back and contact the police. That's my recommendation. If, if you truly have to have and keep that gun in the holster. If the gun goes out of the holster, use that technique that I showed you. And what I want you to do is expect somebody on the other side of the wall, the corner, the window. Uh, I want you to imagine the most scariest thing possible on that side. That way, when something pops up, you're not going to be startled and your finger enter the trigger guard and then your gun goes off. Okay. These are some techniques that I would use for sure. Um, again, some of you are wondering or saying, I, I still will keep my gun in the holster. So in 2018, I did a, I did a tactical debrief um, with somebody who is of significance that's associated with a security company in the Chico area. Um, I actually did a tactical debrief on my 40 hour online private patrol operator leadership and development course on the use of force module. And I used that body camera footage as a training, as a training tool, which you have is a 459 alarm going off. Um, I think it was a business and the security officer starts clearing the area with his gun out. And all of a sudden this guy um, came out of the bushes and ambushed the security officer. Luckily the security officer was able to get one round off and that round made impact with this person that attacked him. Um, had that gun been in the holster, I think that there would have been a different situation. What ended up happening was this burglar um, went to the, uh, he, he broke into the um, the office or the, the facility and I think he saw the security officer approaching. So he grabbed a piece of, of glass and he began um, lying in wait. He began lying in wait. This is more of a reason to have your gun out of the holster. Okay, don't keep it in the holster. You're gonna end up getting seriously hurt. And if you look at that body camera footage, this is an area of the unknown, an area where you can't clearly see behind the corners, you can't see clearly behind the bush. That gun needs to go out. I will leave a link in the description box to that video if I find it. If not, at least the news article. Um, it's very hard for me to find that article. This is 2017. This is Chico, California. The security officer for this security company was involved in this shooting. Um, this, I'm just giving you some Google search at search tools or search terms. And then after that, um, two Chico police officers were involved in an OIS with that same guy. I think the guy broke the toilet and used the porcelain to try to stab the Chico police officers. So his life was, his life was ended for him. Okay. Um, 
I was going through the comments and Rude Dog made a comment, something to the effect of um, he worked some accounts in the area where there would be dual security responses from two different security companies. He worked for company number one and then ACS was security company number two. And they would do a mediocre job approaching these 459 situations. So that's that's all we really know about that. Um, I don't have too much intel. I did go on the ACS website and I looked at their pay. Their pay is between $17 an hour and 23 to start. Um, I'm told by one of my sources that the average pay is about $21 an hour. Um, guys and gals, for West Los Angeles, this is horrible pay. You can't live with $21 in a decent neighborhood. I mean, it's it's what you're going to end up getting is entry level security officers. This is their first job ever. This might be their first time ever approaching a 459 alarm situation with almost no training. Um, that's what you, that's that's what you're going to get. Now, I'm not saying that if you pay somebody seventeen dollars an hour, you're going to get the worst employee. No, I'm I'm just saying that employees with higher skill sets usually go to companies that pay more. <clears throat> they do offer about $32 an hour for for law enforcement. Um, if you're off-duty law enforcement, you get about $32 an hour. That is horrible pay. Um, you're, you're not, you're not going to get a full-time law enforcement officer from that area for sure because the average pay per hour is somewhere between $40 and $50 an hour in that area. At $32 an hour, they might as well work a grant detail, stay overtime court, um, do something because 32, that's not going to be worth it for them. They're probably not going to end up taking these assignments. Once again, you're going to get somebody that's less trained. Um, now there are reserve officers out there. Now I love reserve officers. They put their life on the line every single day asking for nothing in return, asking for nothing more than can I have the badge and please swear me in to protect the citizens of California or the United States or both. Um, but the the reality is reserve officers don't have the same experience experiences in most circumstances than full-time law enforcement. Um, do they have the same training? Well, they, they both go through the police academy, but the intensity of the training is usually more. I mean, you usually have to go through more training as a full-time law enforcement officer rather than part-time. Otherwise, your reserve officers would would technically be full time officers with all that all that training, so I would see a reserve officer probably jump on the thirty two dollars an hour um, pay, not all the time, but I'm sure that they can get paid forty dollars an hour in that same area, maybe even fifty dollars an hour. So what you're left with is once again um, people whose job that this is their first their first security job. Okay, it may be. It may be a good thing for the employer because they don't have to pay that much, but it's also a bad thing. Um, you, you guys who own the security companies, you need to start training your employees more. You need to start doing reality-based training, um, not just within yourselves, okay? Get outside training. Um, have an outside trainer train you guys. Contact me, um, ssundal at yahoo.com. It's S-S-U-N-D-A-H-L at yahoo.com. We have hosted, in conjunction with with Randy from GVPS, a total of three courses, three CQB courses. Um, one of them was law enforcement only. Another portion was SWAT only. And the two other classes that we had, um, it was open to security. And we basically filled up the classes. Randy recommends that you have a total of two days of CQB. Um, there's a security company in San Diego called Citywide protection services and they actually hired randy to do a day two um, a lot of security companies don't want to put their staff through that because it's too expensive which is ridiculous you guys this this is a this is risk mitigation you guys as owners of security companies as managers you should be risk mitigators by having proper training your security officers are less inclined to make these mistakes it, I, I i truly think it's worth it. Yes, you're gonna to have to fork out a lot of money, but look at the long end. And honestly, I think that the security officer who got arrested, I think he's kind of like the scapegoat. He's definitely the, sca the scapegoat. Um, I think that his employer 
Okay, the whoever owns the security company or manage it manages it should be the one in jail for failure to train. Now, if this employee was trained and didn't perform the standards, then that's a different issue. Uh, but let's stop using some of these people as as scapegoats, okay? Whoa. <laughs> Did I say something that angered the universe? Ugh. Oh, I can't find it. Anyhow, um, one of the subscribers reached out to me and basically suggested because of this incident, in California, our regulatory board known as BSIS, they might actually push forward legislation that requires more training or even disarming. I don't think he... I don't think he spoke about disarming, but this is something that I thought about. Maybe disarming some of these alarm response officers. I don't know what the significant, I don't know if this person who was shot, this poor 88-year-old lady, I don't know if, if she is politically affiliated. I don't know who she knows, but if this is an interracial situation, oh man, you have, you got some legislation in route. Okay, so thank you for a subscriber for mentioning that. Um... Yeah, there, 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 there's so much, there's so much um, training that's involved, so much debriefing that's involved in the situation. Hopefully, you guys who are training managers, you guys got to really, 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 really um, talk about this. Talk about these situations. When do you draw your firearm? When do you not draw your firearm? When do you just back up and call the police? Very, very important. I just don't think it's worth it for this guy who's now in jail, who's probably getting anywhere between $17 an hour and $21 an hour. And I don't know if his employer is bailing him out of jail. I don't know. And from what I've seen out there, I don't, I don't think so. So that's all I got. I'm looking forward to the feedback from everybody. If I have any links, just please check out my description box below. Take care, guys.